All right, here we go. Uh, I am with uh, Vikas Ahmed, a uh, journalist formerly working in Pakistan, uh, uh, editor at uh, former editor at Daily Pakistan, recently uh, head of content at the Business Recorder. Uh, so welcome, Vikas. Uh, thank you, Justin. So we are going to talk about the um, coup. <laughs> I, I know I shouldn't call it that. Maybe it's a constitutional transition uh, and no confidence vote um, in Pakistan. But, um, you know, I think, why don't we first talk about why, uh, why we maybe think it may, may have been a coup, actually. Do you want to start with that? Yeah, let's, let's start with that. Uh, there is, uh, before this coup happened, the, this peaceful transition of power from one civilian government to another, that has been like, there has, there is no interference by anyone. It happened organically. Let's, let's look at the organic credentials of this, right? So one of the biggest accusation uh, against the PTI government before this whole thing started since 2018, uh, Bilawal, uh, the, the head of opposition party PPP and uh, Maryam Nawaz Sharif, one of the leaders of PMLN have been accusing Imran Khan of one specific thing. And his government was called a selected government. So what does the word selected mean? Selected, that, that was an accusation on Imran Khan's PTI government. Selected, according to them, meant that Imran Khan was brought in by the military. And how did they say that Imran Khan was brought in by the military? They say that these small parties like GDA, BAP, and MQM joined PTI on the behest of Pakistan's military. These parties listen to the military, they listen to the ISI, and they move according to their wishes. So what did we see when all of this happened? All of these parties left PTI and they joined, they joined other parties. So if their claim was that these parties joined PTI on, on the wishes of the military, who, who's, on whose wishes did they leave? Right. Right. So, so it, I, I mean, there is a, on the Pakistani left, I think I've heard this a number of times, the idea that this is just a kind of a ruling intra ruling class uh, spat. Um, it's not a big deal and it has nothing to do with the working class. So does that mean that in some sense uh, there is an argument that uh, Imran Khan was sort of like the army candidate back in 2018? Um I think that's plausible, at least in the sense that, you know, no candidate maybe can make it all the way to the prime minister's office without some, at least, you know, at least they, they can't fully oppose him 100% and have him get there. No? What do you think of that? Yeah, definitely. They, they yeah. can't be, they, there are no absolutes, right? Yeah. So the, you, you can't like completely say that this is completely divorced from what, what is happening on the ground or the wishes of the people yeah. or the working class. You can say that they, obviously all politics, if our politics is is uh, removed from from the working class, that is yeah. true. That is the nature of how Elementary. the current system is built. Yeah. You know, it is a capitalist system, and power politics works this way. But it would also be unfair to say that there, there is no public support or there is no public interest in it. Uh, the main issue in Pakistan for the past 70 years has been the supremacy of the executive, military interference in politics. If we say that this has never happened, we'd be lying to ourselves. And military interference in politics eventually ends up interfering in your democracy. And interference in your dem democracy it, it affects the working class. Why should it not? Why, does, why won't it? And if you deny that, you're not being completely honest. So, okay, so let's, um, let's talk a bit about the chronology just to make sure everybody listening understands. So there, um, Imran Khan's prime minister uh, in, as of 2018, right? Uh, yeah, he wins the, yeah. That August 2018. And it's yes. a, a so-called minority government. So it depends yeah. on uh, support from the outside. It's a coalition, which is yeah. why it's vulnerable to defections and this kind of yes. no confidence vote. So, um, in between 2018 and 2022, it's a five-year term, so it would have expired next year. Right? Next year, yes. Uh, yes. And in between those, uh, in those four years, we had COVID, 
we had yeah. uh, the pandemic and then we also had this major event of the uh the taliban ousting the u.s from afghanistan yeah so that yeah. was probably you know i think that's a bit of an elephant in the room people aren't really talking about that very much enough uh but i think um i don't know uh i've heard people say that he had no imran khan had no role in this anyway um but i i suspect that you know, Pakistan has been so heavily involved in Afghanistan for 40 years, at least, <laughs> the current yeah. wars. Um, yeah. And now, uh, and now under Imran Khan is when it ha so happened that the U.S. is finally thrown out of Afghanistan. I wouldn't give Imran Khan the credit of this. Uh, mm -hmm. This was mostly Trump's policy. Trump wanted okay. to disengage with many of uh, the U.S. engagements abroad. Okay. And you can say with all of his uh, shortcomings, Trump was less of an imperialist than Democrats have been. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and Biden eventually continued. I guess there was an understanding in Pentagon that uh, direct in engagement or boots on the ground in Afghanistan had become unsustainable. It just so happened that in Pakistan, we had a prime minister who agreed to that specific policy. Right. And in 2018, when sorry, last year in 2021, when it finally happened and Imran Khan was in office, he appreciated that. Yeah. But uh, he also said a lot of wrong things. Okay. Uh, so one thing that nobody has actually noticed in the past week, the day Imran Khan was ousted, there was a drone attack in Afghanistan, oh. uh, an American drone strike in Afghanistan after such a long time. And uh, in uh, 2021, in August, when, when Afghanistan, when Kabul fell to the Taliban, Imran Khan said some wrong things, especially to inter international media. One of the asks that Pentagon has from Pakistan is some military bases so that they can carry out drone strikes in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. They exactly. pretend yeah. these days that that is not true, but the cost of uh, and the time and, 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 and cost generally involved in carrying out drone attacks from like bases in Qatar or Saudi Arabia or yeah. even UAE is much higher. Absolutely. And it's it's not tenable in the long run. You can have a few drone strikes, like the one that happened least recently mm -hmm. has happened after a long time. Like the last one happened in August. So this is a fresh one. Eventually, they need one secret base like Shamsi. Pakistani army had provided the Shamsi air base during the war on terror, where Pakistani army did not have any boots on the ground. It was completely run by the Americans where they carried out drone attacks from. So it's important not to have like not to have presence uh, as much as they used to have during the war on terrorist days, but at least has had a forward operating base for the drones. Yeah, that's what Imran I think. Khan, yeah. yeah. So Imran Khan shut that door completely. Yeah. He could have he could have been diplomatic last year in August. He could have said, "Oh, we'll talk about it." This is what the military wanted. To, to, to have some room to argue, to have some room to maneuver. But Imran Khan said the wrong thing. He completely shut that door by putting an absolutely in front of a not. So right. that was one of the reasons that he had to go. So that's one. And then there's also, I mean, when the, when the CIA does these kinds of covert operations, they always fund it with drug revenue, opium. Um, in the case of Afghanistan, Pakistan, and the Taliban are eliminating that, uh, they say. Um, and so there must be also some kind of covert funding uh, that the Pakistan military secret services covert operations must have been uh, counting on in their budget that they may have lost with this, right? Is there some kind of Afghanistan gravy train uh that i cannot comment much on it because these <laughs> things uh these things are super secret so i don't do not yeah. have a lot of proof but yeah in, in the 80s a lot of things were financed by drugs and even taliban have financed a lot of yeah. their, their yeah. war with drugs and that that might happen but right. that that's that's small fish okay. the the bigger thing is you know the the military aid that you get america mm -hmm. Uh, still owes Pakistan coalition support fund. So coalition support fund, if those of your uh, viewers who do not know, is 
the money that the United States used to give Pakistani military as a reimbursement for the services provided by the Pakistani military. Right. What services does the Pakistani military provide the American military? Um, attacking terrorists on the Pakistani side of the border, running operations that coincide with American military interests. So Americans say run an operation here. Pakistan army goes in, into that town, cleans it up, and then sends the bill to the Pentagon to, and it goes into the Senate. That that um, CSF has been stopped for a long time now. Right. And there is there is a bill that Pakistan army has sent to the Pentagon and it has been pending for a while now. Right. And that bill has to be cleared. It was stopped because of the naughty things that uh, Pakistani military establishment had been doing with Americans. So that bill has to be cleared. So that's one of the big ticket items. Right. And then there's all the weapons sales, right? So yeah, the weapon sales, uh, uh, definitely sanctions. So tell me about because uh, I saw a little bit of a, an army chief talking about how um, they, they want they wanted to be closer to the US and and how weapon sales, Pakistan would want to buy more weapons from America and they're only buying Chinese ones because the US won't sell them theirs. Uh, t- can you talk about that event a little bit? What that yeah. was? So uh, we have to go into his history of Pakistani military. Pakistani military was basically an evolution of the British, the, the Royal British Army when Pakistan inherited the, the British military. Uh, this was an army trained by the British. Eventually, when the British left, we found a similar partner in the 50s and the 60s when uh, Yukon was in power. Our partner at that time was America. So America built the Pakistani army. Uh, Americans trained our officers. All of you know, So much of our culture that we have inside Pakistani army, if you just visit a mess, you'll realize how much influenced it is by the British and the Americans. So it is mm-hmm. a completely westernized army. That culture eventually translated into technology and all the technology that we started getting from Americans was uh, it, all, all of the, the equipment that we had was American. Even in 2019, when uh, Pakistan had this small battle with India or upper hand that we eventually had was F-16s and Mm -hmm. American equipment. That is why we could stand up to Americans in 2019. If we did not have F-16s, the result of that battle would have been completely different. Mm -hmm. So it is American equipment that gives us upper hand over India. And that has always been the case. Despite of India's extreme huge size compared to Pakistan, India has not been able to decisively defeat Pakistan or or completely bring it to its knees. All Mm -hmm. wars arguably have ended in in a stalemate. Mm -hmm. That is because some of the American equipment that we have. And uh, if we lose that, if we move to Chinese, there are so many problems. Uh, The number one problem is it's long-term interoperability Mm -hmm. between all the equipment we have. So everything has to be phased in. Secondly, the Chinese equipment is still inferior to the American equipment. Mm -hmm. And we like shiny stuff. So the shiniest (laughs) stuff on the market is American stuff and they're good. And also when you when you get American equipment, you have your officers who go to America who live in, you know, nice and places and courses, training courses for a yeah. year, for two years, you live in America, you, you get nice TADA. When you get go to China, it's annoying, you know, you don't have a lot of fun in China, you don't speak the language, there's a huge culture shock. So there's a tendency for Pakistani leadership, not just military, even civilian to be Western, uh, to be more on the leaning towards the West. There's something, uh, a Chinese diplomat in Lahore, when I used to be an editor uh, in Lahore, uh, there was a Chinese diplomat who said something very interesting and he was talking about CPEC. He said that China is a big country. There's so much money that we can actually invest in Pakistan. This $60 billion is nothing. Talking about CPEC, right? $16 billion is nothing for us. But the problem is Pakistani leadership does not want to leave the West. Mm -hmm when you're willing to do that, then we'll talk. Mm-hmm. So Pakistani leadership cannot be weaned off the best. And, and I mean, they've, I think, I'll, I think China has made it very clear that 
they're they're friends with whoever's in government in Pakistan. Yeah. The cha- the relationship's not going to change, and so on. Yes. So they're not going to s- stick by Imran Khan or anything like that. Uh, that's, they see it as a relationship between the countries. Um, but I gather that from the military establishment's perspective, uh, they just feel like uh, Imran maybe tilted a little too. Like there's a balancing act between China and the, that so-called all-weather uh, alliance um, and America, which has all these uh, appealing things for them. And they, you know, back in when, when, when they were all collaborating in the Afghan war, uh, you know, in the 80s, 90s, everybody got along. It was great. But now it's like the U.S. wants you to choose and there's this tightrope and they, I gather they felt like Imran went a little too far towards China, Russia, away from the U.S. Possibly. Uh, but this push towards China was not led by Imran Khan in the first place. Right. So Imran right. Khan inherited this. Uh, mm-hmm. Imran Khan had momentum behind behind him. Mm-hmm. So the about for face that had to be done wasn't supposed to be done by Imran Khan. It was supposed to be led by the military who were going in that direction, who were leading mm-hmm. Imran Khan. Mm-hmm. This, it is an excuse that Imran Khan was was a roadblock in it. Imran Khan, th- this is not an issue that Imran Khan would never have uh, budged from. So, but Chinese have seen Pakistan. I'm sorry, I'm getting you off no, to no. answer your initial question. Chinese have seen Pakistanis collaborate with America. They have been patient throughout the war on terror. They mm-hmm. understand the tightrope that we have to walk through. Even if China does not like or strategic shifts to and fro, they will never be vocal about it. They will be patient about it because they think in long term. They understand that Pakistani uh, political leaderships will change. People will come and go. Nobody has finished their time. The military will stay. So they will not antagonize nice Pakistani military. They'll just patiently wait and watch. This class of PMA will, the, the one that is on top right now, will graduate and move on. And there will be another cl- class of core commanders. They, they might think about things differently. Mm-hmm. It, so I, and I have excuses. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because uh, there are other things that Imran Khan is accused of, uh, mm-hmm. namely inflation. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, economic mismanagement. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, I am going to the IMF in the first place, which is another accusation that um, he's gone to the IMF. So I wonder, these also don't, I don't find them all that convincing because first of all, the pandemic was disastrous for every economy uh, in the world, except arguably China. And even for China, they, they sacrificed a lot. Um, with you know to to make sure COVID didn't run rampant through their country, but um, the as for the inflation argument, you know he went to Russia specifically to get a a deal to guarantee wheat and energy prices. So you would think that would be a pretty reasonable anti-inflation measure. What do you think of the economic arguments against Imran Khan? Uh, there's weight on both sides actually. Uh, I'll address your IMF question first of all. Mm -hmm. He went to IMF. Yes, he did go to IMF. But let's see how he went to IMF. In 2018, uh, when Imran Khan government came into power in August, the the first cabinet included the first finance minister that Pakistani government had was Asad Umar. So from August 2019 to at least February 2020, the government tried not to go to the IMF. And the biggest issue that the opposition at that time had was, why is the government not going to the IMF? (laughs) Yes. If if you take out all the news headlines from Dawn and like uh, uh, all of these editorials, is Asad Umar should go to the IMF. Asad Umar was eventually fired because he he was resisting going to the IMF. And he he was trying to have a tough negotiation with the IMF. That was 2018 and like it, to, from 2018 to, to early 2019, February, sorry, 2019, this whole thing happened. Why did Pakistan have to go to the IMF? Because in 2018, when the Khan government came into power, it was bankrupt. There was no money. So we had to go somewhere. 
Asad Umar, what he decided to do in 2018, he tried to get uh, a billion dollars from uh, Saudi Arabia. Imran Khan went to China and got a couple of billion dollars into 2018. Even that, they did not uh, fix or balance of payment crisis. So eventually pushing after push by opposition, after like these threats of bank defaults, like international sovereign defaults that was supposed to have happened, um, they eventually had to go to the IMF and take money from them. Uh, which is what every Pakistani government has had to do because yeah, it's one of the most restructured they've had. Pakistan is yeah. some of the, I think, among the countries that have had been restructured for the IMF the most yeah. number of times, like six or seven yeah. times. Yeah, so because Pakistan go, keeps going through these boom bust cycles. Yeah. What every government does in the second half of their governance is they spend so much money that the government doesn't have. They spend so much money because they want to win elections. So even Imran Khan did that. They gave, he gave fuel subsidy that the Pakistani, Pakistan cannot afford. But Pakistanis do not give taxes. So everything has to be financed by the IMF, by the so Saudi Arabia, by China, World Bank. Someone has to come and finance because Pakistani elite refuses to pay taxes. This was one of the problems that Imran Khan was supposed to tackle and he couldn't. So that is his failure. Right, right. So, I mean, um, it seems like he wasn't doing anything all that out of the ordinary uh, in terms of the historical pattern and, and so on. So No, uh, we see, it, it, if you take the, these three and a half years of Imran Khan's government, we see Imran Khan knocking on every door trying to push it open, and then on the first sign of resistance, giving up. Take okay. this tax thing. He, he hired one, uh, the head of one of the biggest tax firms in Pakistan to head the, the FBR, Shabar Zedi. He's a great guy. If you ask any professional in Karachi, they'll tell you he's extremely competent when it comes to tax matters. Then uh, he tried to uh, have tax reforms. He met resistance from bureaucracy, from the business leadership. Imran Khan did not put his weight in behind him. Shabar Zedi got depression. He, literally, he wrote a Twitter thread that I got so depressed <laughs> that I had to leave Islamabad. He got anxiety and depression and he left. That's it. You, you got one guy who tried to have reforms. You gave him anxiety. You sent him home. And then you're like, oh, we can't do this. So you first sign of resistance, depression and anxiety, you're, you're just giving up. That, that's it. That's, what, that's one of the biggest failures of Imran Khan. He didn't push hard enough. But arguably, you can say that, that it's really hard to reform a country where, where corruption is so entrenched that whichever door that you try to open, you realize that it's locked by these vested interests that, that own the country, that right. own bureaucracy, that, have, that are so deeply entrenched that it's so hard unless you dig up the root of the country. So um, the, another, another question is the memo. I can't memo. hear you, I lost oh, you. Oh, you can't hear me now? You cannot hear me. Well, that's interesting. Um, is it on my side? I don't yeah. know. Uh, well, no, no, uh, can you hear me now by chance? Nothing. No. Should we rejoin? Okay, cool. Okay, just to, to pick up where we left off. Um, mm -hmm. The, the, so, okay, <laughs> just to, because we're talking about, you know, we're, I think we're doing a kind of an honest assessment of, uh, of Imran Khan, like flaws yeah. and all that, that seems to be how we've ended up. But, but, you know, the question is, so the, the, the people start defecting from, from PTI, the non-confidence vote is coming. And then Imran Khan comes out and says, no, because these people have been meeting with the U S at the embassy and it's a conspiracy. So yeah. The opposition, and I'd say the, the Pakistan media, as far as I've been reading it, um, has been pretty dismissive of this, uh, of this argument. And from my perspective, like, it's much, it's much harder to believe that there was no U.S. interference in a country, not because it's Pakistan and not because of any particular uh, issue, 
so much as simply because the U.S. interferes in every country in the world and has done so forever, right? Yeah. I mean, like since 1945, the list of regime changes uh, by the U.S. is in the hundreds. So yeah. why wouldn't they? How? Why wouldn't they do that? We know they're out to punish everybody that uh, stayed neutral, specifically around Russia, Ukraine. Why? Why would we? Why would it be so surprising that they would? This is 2022. It has been such a long time and there has been so much interference. If someone proves it, now the burden of proof is on yeah. them to prove That's that there what I has think. been no interference. It is outrageous to even suggest that there is no interference. Have you seen Islamabad's <laughs> embassy, US embassy in Islam? Have you seen the size of that thing? Right. Do you realize how many people live in that thing? Why, why do they live? Have you seen the photos of the meeting that these people have been having with the Pakistani politicians? There's like hundreds of photos. Why have they been meeting all of these people if there is no interference? has so, so. imagine imagine the russian ambassador in in washington uh or in new york going around meeting all of the black Live, lives matter yeah. leadership or or or, or any the, of the, the opposite party i mean it's, yeah or q and on like yeah. just talking to them like meeting trump they the sky would collapse yeah. if 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 the russian ambassador today met trump yeah, they took out some Facebook ads in 2016. Yeah, they took out Facebook ads. America and, and, lost yeah, their minds. Yeah. Lost so, their mind. There was a sword hanging over Trump for five years in the Russia Gate investigation. And just because of Twitter posts, like Facebook posts, there was nothing. And it was elections uh, rigged. The Trump, the elections that Trump got elected in, they were not rigged. They were completely constitutional, but they would have removed Trump if the ties to Russia had been proven. And right. I think that was not a great investigation anyway. Right, right. So that's the that's the that's the same argument that I guess Imran Khan was making. So where does you know? There's another phrase that, <laughs> that I gather it comes from the current now prime minister, uh, which is beggars can't be choosers. Where yeah. does that where does that fit in? Can you tell us the story of beggars can't be choosers? Oh yeah, th this is a huge PR disaster for Shehbaz Sharif. He was not supposed to say that. It comes from when Imran Khan uh, it told everyone, basically uh, explained the fact that there was a letter that, that uh, a Pakistani embassy in D.C. had uh, sent to the government claiming that Americans had some hand in it or some interest in the collapse of the Imran Khan government. When he came out publicly with that, he said Imran Khan claimed, now this is Imran Khan's claim, he claimed that this was being done because America did not want Pakistan to have an independent foreign policy. Mm -hmm. And he was asked, Shibha Sharif was asked this question about independence of Pakistani foreign policy. So he said that since we are beggars, that's what he, was, he meant. Since we are beggars, we cannot... We cannot choose to have an independent foreign policy, but that's a huge gaffe because mm -hmm. he is agreeing that Imran Khan has been removed for the independence of his foreign policy. That was such a huge mistake. But you know, when you're in the know, when you when you understand things, sometimes you forget that you have to pretend something else yeah. in front of people and you have yeah. to pretend something else alone. So he basically gave credence to Imran Khan's uh, statement. And what about this all will be forgiven? Because that was that was someone from the Imran Khan side, a parliamentarian yeah, that, uh, yeah. that was saying, yeah. So that is Imran Khan and his party's claim that the contents of the letter contain this. And so this is one of the sentences that has been used so much. This letter, the, the letter at the center of all of it has been has not been discussed as much as it should have been, especially in the international media. So let's give some time to this letter and yep. understand what Please. this letter <laughs> is. Uh, Pakistan, uh, Pakistani opposition um, wanted to impeach Imran Khan. They brought this impeachment reference in the National Assembly where Imran Khan was supposed to be impeached, the no confidence vote at it, as it is called in the Pakistani constitution. They got, brought this uh, impeachment motion on March 8th. A day before this happened, on March 7th, the Pakistani Prime Minister received a cable from his ambassador in Washington, D.C. That cable contained minutes of the meeting that the ambassador 
had with sec uh, uh, Assistant Secretary of the State Department, uh, uh, Donald Liu. According to this cable, Mr. Donald Liu said to the ambassador that there is going to be a no confidence motion in the Pakistani National Assembly tomorrow. And if it goes through and Imran Khan government is removed, everything will be forgiven and US-Pakistan relationship will improve. What, is, what are all the things that, that will be forgiven? All the things that need to be forgiven is Pakistan's role in the war on terror. Imran Khan's statements till, since 2018, Pakistan's closeness with the recent closeness with Russia and Pakistan's closeness with China. So all of these things, the chart sheet against Pakistan that make a good case for sanctions against Pakistan. You know, there's a sword of sanctions hanging on, of course, on top of Pakistan. Financial Action Task Force. There, there's FATF, yeah. Pakistan is in, and there's Coalition Support Fund we're not being given. IMF is holding Pakistan by the neck, if I use a good body part right now. Yeah, right. You know, acceptable one. So things are really bad. All of this will change, improve, if you kick out this guy. So this... This cable itself, this letter sent is a, a proof, the one and only proof of interference, the concrete proof of uh, interference that we have. There is circumstantial evidence, like meetings with the me, meetings with different politicians, and there's other circumstantial evidence, like State Department, like and Pentagon and White House, not condemning militaries. Mm -hmm. Yep. Current interference in Pakistani politics not being con condemned anywhere. So that I think is circumstantial evidence that uh, the contents of the cable was true. So the charge sheet against Pakistan, that's as as I've said, uh, behavior during war on terror. The behavior by by that which I mean is incomplete support of America. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and of course, um, yeah, Afghanistan, obviously. Yeah, and uh, it's yeah. partial support of the Taliban and um, harboring them during a time when when uh, they were on the run, uh, because some elements in Pakistan understood that America will leave and we'll have to pick mm -hmm. up the pieces. Mm -hmm. Now there's another thing that is happening. What is happening right now is that we see some issues opening up between uh, the Taliban and the Pakistani military. They're not really yeah. happy. Yeah. The, the Pakistani military wanted the Taliban to go after TTP elements in Afghanistan, which they have not satisfactorily done so far. They fenced, so they, off. They fenced yeah. off the border. That's a big difference, maybe. Pakistan had to fence off the border, but they the, the Afghans are not really happy. The, even no. the Taliban government is not happy with the border fence. No. No. So, uh, what I see happening is the Pakistan army is going to pull back from the Taliban and yeah. and maybe ha put some support on the Afghan resistance to balance these things out. And um, I think U.S. wants that too. And this recent drone attack is, um, yeah. you know, a part of uh, that, giving some backup to the Afghan so-called resistance. Um, okay, so the the thing comes out, beggars can't be choosers, all will be forgiven. The speaker tries to delay. They, Imran Khan insists that the only way to oust him is an election. So he dissolves the parliament, he has an election, the Supreme Court reverses that. Then they're in parliament and the speaker keeps trying to delay it. Yeah. Um, right? <laughs> so then, uh, and at some point, Imran Khan tries to dismiss the chief of army staff? That is a rumor. It has okay. not been corroborated yet. Okay, but, so but somebody was going to get arrested. We okay, we yeah. are not sure okay. if Imran Khan tried to remove the chief, but we are sure that the chief tried to stop his removal because there's oh. only one document that exists. <laughs> so this is so funny. This is hilarious, you know. <laughs> chief tried to stop his removal because there is a documentary evidence of chief trying to stop his removal, but there is no evidence as of yet about Imran Khan trying to remove, <laughs> remove the TV. I'll tell you this story. This is so funny. So what happened was after this no confidence vote came into the parliament, the speaker, uh, when he was supposed, he did initially they tried to delay it. I'm going back to uh, 3rd April right now. 
So uh, on 3rd April, the no confidence mo uh, motion is supposed to be voted. Everyone comes. Uh, it's a nice sunny day, right? All the opposition is there. Everyone walks into the parliament. Everyone is so happy. They're going to win today. It's going to be amazing. Uh, Asif Zardari is there. His son Bilawal is there. They even bring their daughter. He, she's sitting out there in the, in, the, uh, in the benches, right? Everyone's going to watch this amazing match today. They come in. The speaker starts the session. The speaker says if anyone has to speak anything before this voting, they should say do so. The Minister of Information, Fawad Choudhury, stands up and says that we have a cable proving that this vote is being brought with the from wishes from like behest of Washington by, by a foreign power, interference in Pakistani politics. No country would accept that. And uh, that, that is true. No country would accept that. So this letter should be taken into account. And the speaker immediately with this huge powerful voice says that, yes, this is true. This, is, you know, in light of this- It's the first that thing I'm hearing of it, but you know, <laughs> yeah. sounds very convincing. <laughs> sounds very convincing. So uh, this is very concerning. So I would cancel this word and that word was canceled. And then Supreme Court took notice of this and then Supreme Court had four day nonstop hearings and they, did they declared this unconstitutional now case can be there there was a review petition that we that was filed case can be made that uh doing something on the behest of the foreign government is unconstitutional yeah it is unconstitutional and the speaker could have made the case that if the, this unconstitutional thing is happening it makes the whole process void ab initio uh that's what happened uh but coming back to the main point uh, this what was the question? Oh, yeah, no, no. So that so that that happens, but then the Supreme Court overturns yeah. all of that. Yeah, so. over overturns all, all of that. Now the only card left with Imran Khan at this point is to remove, I guess, remove the army chief, or the army chief has anticipated that he will be removed because Imran Khan suspects the whole nation suspects that all of these machinations, the, the leaving of the, the uniting of the opposition cannot happen without the approval of the army chief. So this guy who may have been working in the shadows against Imran Khan has to be removed. Imran Khan reaches the conclusion or the chief suspects that Imran Khan will reach this conclusion. The night before Imran Khan was finally removed, there was a rumor that Imran Khan has fired the army chief. As soon as that rumor spread, there was there, there's this guy in Islamabad. He goes to the Islamabad High Court, knocks the door of the Islamabad High Court in the middle of the night, 12 a.m. I don't know which door you knock to get the High Court opened at 12 a.m., but this guy knew. Nobody else knows. You don't know that, okay? Mm -hmm. Nobody in Pakistan, this guy knows. He opened the High Court at 12 a.m. at in the morning or night, whatever you call it, and that so the high court opens in the middle of the night. And the petition is Imran Khan might fire the army chief. So before he does that, before Imran Khan hires the army, uh, fires the army chief, this move should be this declared unconstitutional. Now, Imran Khan, as the chief executive of the country, as the prime minister, has the power to fire the army chief. There are no two ways about it. Why did this guy go to preemptively stop that from happening? Interestingly, this is the same guy who in 2009 went for the same reason to the court against General Kiani. So this guy has one job. <laughs> Does this mean that no prime minister can ever fire a army chief again? No, th th this was not uh, heard in the court. The co petition was fire, uh, filed. But the petition would have been heard only if the oh. if prime minister had fired him. So if I so, there's see. a it's such a I'll share that with you. The petition has a blank space for the number of uh, for the for the reference number of the 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 petition that for for the letter for the order Imran Khan's order that was supposed to fire. So that is a blank space where the number of that order has to be written. That this order order number X Y Z has to be voided by the court, and that so space it's a is blank. Literal get out of jail free card. Get out of jail free card. And and the funniest thing about this get out of jail free card is that it was made in March. The date oh, on he, that, it, yeah, the date on that get out of jail free card is March. So this is one smoking gun. 
the chief thought that Imran Khan will fire him and he brought that's that final card at the end and this is Imran Khan I guess Imran Khan sticking to everything till the final moment ensured <laughs> that the chief comes out in the open he smoked him out <laughs> okay okay speaking of people coming out we've seen massive massive demonstrations uh uh, immediately after Imran Khan was ousted. Yeah. What What's this about? Is the uh, was Imran Khan really that popular? Is it the the sleaziness of the way he was ousted? Is it the the impugning of Pakistan's independence? What What do you think is going on here? Imran Khan has always been popular. Mm -hmm. So Imran Khan has been popular since. Like mainstream proper popularity, he was the second second biggest party in 2013. In 2013 elections, uh, Imran Khan got like I guess 40 something seats, but a huge number of popular vote. So uh, he has been popular for a long time. He is a huge crowd puller. But when everyone united against Imran Khan, it it brought back all of the people who were not happy with Imran Khan. So the past couple of years for the whole world have not been really good. So I've been, uh, I've lived my whole life in Pakistan, but I came to New York in uh, 2020. And I've seen how uh, economic situation in the US has deteriorated. Inflation has gone up significantly. There's, uh, there's, unhappiness again like with the government nobody is nobody's satisfied and you'll see this this kind of despondency all over the world the, the world is coming out of a pandemic it, it, economies were halted inflation is going up all over the world and since this russia thing since oil prices went up things are really bad people do not when a poor person in pakistan sees the gas prices going up they will not see ukraine russia fight they will see their own prime minister and they will say Imran Khan is not doing a good job. And they did rightfully think so. But eventually, but when this whole thing happened, that became a smaller issue than this bigger issue. Pakistani sovereignty will always be a bigger issue, especially in for, for, for the people who vote for Imran Khan. It is said that Imran Khan is supported by the military, but that is not entirely true. The military has been supported by the followers of Imran Khan. These are people who are center right now switch because their core value is Pakistani sovereignty. And that, that is what we saw a couple of days ago when everyone came out, massive crowds, and he'll keep pulling these crowds. But the question is, how is this popular outpour translated into an electoral victory? That remains to be seen. And and I guess, uh, yeah, yeah, like what I'm looking for is, I imagine they will get a drone base back. They will um, move away. Yeah, from they they the won't Taliban. announce it. They'll have a, a somewhere yeah. up in Blochistan, maybe Shamsi again something close to Afghanistan where drones can fly from Qatar to there and then from they can conduct their daily yeah. operations. And and I also expect that the opposition will try to delay an election for a while. Um, yeah. I don't think they're going to, I don't think they're yeah. going to let there be an election right now. They would lose for sure. They will, they will. Uh, also, there's it's, it's something they're going to try gerrymandering. So um, yeah. uh, the election commission has announced delimitations, uh, the, like reframing all the constituencies of Pakistan. So all of the constituencies will be rewritten. Uh, and the ECP, the chairman of the ECP right now is extremely anti-government. He has uh, given really foolish statements. Uh, things like electronic uh, voting machines are unfeasible. They can never work, like completely discarding them, even the suggestion, because uh, they want complete control over the electoral process. They want it to be manual. So uh, elections will be extremely rigged. The military is going to support opposition so in, in this situation, even if elections are held today, if a massively rigged election is conducted, Imran Khan will not win. 
which is the reason why this vote was brought in, which is also, you know, one of the reasons because Pakistan was going into elections next year anyway. There was yeah. no reason for for this last year for to insist right. on coming into power last year. Let Imran Khan take take all the yeah. Like, he can know? wear all these bad policies, and they can Policy, yeah. spend the rest of the time criticizing him, criticizing him, and go okay, take him to elections. But the, there are prizes on the line. The pr- biggest prize is in November the army chief's uh, extension, or um, you know, the ch- changing of the army chief is coming up. His retirement is coming up in, in November. Yeah, the 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 opposition wants to control who the next army chief is. If they control who the next army chief is, they control the elections. They control the DGISI. If they control all, all of these things, they ensure that they come into power. Why? Because the elephant in the room is military interference in Pakistani politics. So I I gotta say, after our discussion, I'm I'm still feeling like it was a coup. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it was a coup because Americans are not saying it was a coup. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> oh goodness. All right. Well, that was uh yeah, it's not a it's not a, I mean, I, you know, I I do think there they must have been somewhat surprised by the outpouring uh of uh, you know, yeah, uh, yeah. The demonstrations. They, military always they, they have this hubris, this uh, this classic military hubris. They think that they brought Imran Khan into power, which mm-hmm. is not entirely true. I yeah. I was in Lahore when 2018 elections were happening. I saw the support that Im- military gave Imran Khan, and I saw the support that Imran Khan gave the military. It is mm-hmm. not one percent of what has happened now. This is crazy. This is blatant. This is dialed up to 11 right. that was there was some uh, collaboration between the military and Imran Khan but th- that was nothing and military benefited more from it there were yeah. so many candidates that Imran Khan could have fielded that were replaced by the military candidate there were military candidates who got the popular support that Imran Khan's candidate would have gotten so right. all of them Imran Khan's can- vote went to these electables that were backed by the military. Right. So military thought these these uh, power brokers they thought that no Imran Khan is 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 a pawn. He's just a child. We're backing them if we take the support. But we haven't seen that. Let's let's see if you take the support away from Imran Khan and let's hold a free and fair election. Do not support PMLN. Do not support uh, P, uh, PPP. Mm-hmm. And let's see who wins a free and fair game. But they will not do that. They will never do that because they want to ensure one thing. Even in 2018 election, they wanted to ensure that Imran Khan government comes into power, but it is a weak coalition government. So the support that military, the support that military gave to the Imran Khan was ensuring that it is it does not have two third majority. It is a weak coalition government, so that we can do what we just did. Yeah. Well, I guess it s- slows the process down a little bit of of in- the inevitable rise of Europe of Eurasia <laughs> and the inevitable yeah. decline of the U.S. But. Uh, I, I don't looks, know when looks that to was me like to the, ha- looks to happen, me like but, the Americans the, have won this one. <laughs> yeah, but the democratic process in Pakistan has taken a hit. Yeah. So this is a this is a very long struggle, and it is it is so unfortunate that Pakistani democracy has gone back at least twenty years. We are back in Musharraf era, and we are doing the same thing. This is American backed military coup, just like just like it, it, it used to be. Good old days are back. The boys are getting back together. Hussain Akani and all the people are, are back in action. G- guys are getting bases back. Russia will be taught a lesson. You know, th- this is the empire once again exerting itself because Trump had stepped back. He, there were fires all over the globe. Now the Democrats have to put out that, those fires. And Imran Khan was this Dump, dumpster fire for the empire they put it out it's gone they put it out all right Vikas thank you so much thank you thank you Justin for inviting me <laughs>